We'll circle back to these popular positions at the end of this treatment. Here's how uh, I want to develop a doctrine of scripture. The Bible's character and work are bound up in its relationship with Jesus Christ. All right? I think you can develop a robust doctrine of scripture by going through Atlanta, by going through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and seeing the roles that the scriptures of Israel and the scriptures of his followers play in that life. Scripture didn't start with, with uh, Matthew chapter 1 or Mark chapter 1. There was already scripture when Jesus arrived. He comes to a world that already has holy scripture. Maturing Israel, especially post-exilic Israel, acknowledges as Holy Scripture, first and foremost, and really most centrally, the Torah. The first five books of the Bible, otherwise known as the Pentateuch. You could understand the Pentateuch as the gospel of Israel's creation and Israel's emancipation, along with the rules that it needs to respect if it's going to enjoy that life and that emancipation and those blessings. The Torah is the center of Israel's scriptures. Less central um, are the prophets. In its heart, Israel had never quite arrived at a full trust in God. Moses has to say as his farewell, I know your, your hearts are already wandering. With a few you know, notable exceptions, Israel falls apart devotionally, culturally, and finally politically. That would describe the former prophets, the narrative framework in which these messages of warning and promise are embedded. God sends prophets to warn of the consequences of Israel's failure and to assure Israel that God is going to deliver them after they've been destroyed by their own unfaith. Now the Sadducees are the conservatives of Jesus' day, and they acknowledge the authority of the Torah, but the prophets, they're not as convinced about. They reject the canonicity of the prophets. The Pharisees accept the canonicity of the prophets, and Jesus sides with the Pharisees there, and, and, and he treats the prophets as inspired as well. And finally, the writings. The word writings is great because it, you can't really classify them. They're, a, they're kind of a grab bag, kind of a kitchen sink category. So Jews call them writings, ketuvim. The writings are things like Psalms, Proverbs, wisdom literature. The writings embody Israel's growing self-understanding and growing understanding of God as it lives and dies and hopes for a future. That's Israel's scripture. The Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Those are the three sections of what Israel, what, what Jews call the Bible, and what Christians call the Old Testament. And Jesus takes it on. Unlike the Sadducees who privilege the Torah and really exclude the rest as canonical or binding, Jesus never critiques the writings of the Old Testament of Israel's Bible. Instead, he obeys them. Well, first of all, actually, he doesn't even obey them. He just grows up in them. They nourish him. They are the soil from which he grows as a, as a boy. Right? He goes to synagogue. He prays. He lives a holy life under the Torah. So, Scripture is Jesus' heritage. It's the horizon of his moral, theological, cultural world. They're his constitution. The scriptures of Israel are his formation. 
They are how he becomes who he is as a first century Jew. Israel's life is so ordered by the scriptures that Jesus' particularity is, is unthinkable apart from their role. And you might not have thought of this before, but Jesus is who he is because of scripture's effect on him. Luke 2.52 says he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and humanity. And the scriptures are one of the critical ways that he grows in wisdom. He embodies the wise one of the Proverbs. He embodies the blessed one of the Psalms. In the wilderness, he speaks back Torah to keep himself centered on the way forward the way into the land, the way to secure its blessings. Scripture is his plausibility structure, not just because he's a Jew, but because he's the Messiah. Scripture supplies his mission. I don't know if he knew that. I don't know, I don't know when he learned that, but I like to think maybe he learned it in synagogue. You know, maybe he learned it in bar mitzvah class, and they're reading the prophets, and he's like, oh, that's me, you know? Uh, he goes back and goes to his synagogue and says, I have a reading for us today, and pulls out Isaiah 61 and says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Today this has been fulfilled. This stuff's about me. They define his mission, regardless of when he becomes conscious of it. Scripture defines his mission. And so, you might think of the scriptures of Israel not just as the canon of certain first century Jews. I think, first and foremost, they are Jesus' canon. They are the rule of God and the word of God on and for him. And he obeys them out of obedience to the Father. And so, Christians obey them out of obedience to the Father because the servant is not above his or her master. This, to me, sets aside practically all of the critical questions that come up. Who wrote the Pentateuch? I don't know. Um, at the end of the day, it's not going to affect Jesus' relationship with the Torah as one of obedience, guidance, formation. And so, it shouldn't really affect ours. It can help inform our readings to make our readings better, but it's never going to those answers are never going to displace scripture from the life of Jesus or his disciples. So, if you've taken Old Testament already and you've been rocked by critical questions, um, do, do we need to be? We'll come back to the questions about inaccuracies, but for the moment, I don't think they're as decisive as either liberals or fundamentalists tend to think they are.